All right, let's take the book this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. 1621, from that time forth began Jesus to show in his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, that's something. That's a man getting God by the shirt sleeve and telling him off. And Peter calls him over and tells him off. And says, If be it far from thee, O Lord, this shall not be to thee. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his work. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, and there probably are some here this morning, which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Father, bless the reading of your word. May the Holy Spirit honor this word, and may the Holy Spirit confirm this word for what it is in truth, the absolute truth, the infallible word of righteousness. Bless it, Father, and may some unsaved person find Christ the Savior this morning. Bless our friend that couldn't be with us today. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful to see so many old familiar faces back with us again in the services, and I pray you'll minister to them. And it won't be just me, but that you'll do the preaching, and you'll do the teaching, and you'll do the exhortation. We put all we have in your hands for safekeeping and blessing in this hour. We ask thee, Father, to save souls and edify the saints. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Now I want to talk to you this morning on have you counted the cost, except I'm going to talk to you about it from a little different standpoint than you hear it talked about. The text I've just read takes two things for granted. I read a text there that said, what is it a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, that text takes two things for granted. Number one, it takes for granted that you have a soul. Now, maybe to a psychiatrist or a scientist, you don't. Christ takes for granted you do. All right, number two, the text takes for granted that if you could get the whole world in exchange for that soul, you'd make a bum deal. That is, if you could get everything the Kennedy family had, and everything, all the national fascism and socialism of uh, the popes and the dictators and the common turn and the USSR, all the fishes in the sea, all the fowls of heaven, all the diamonds in South Africa, all the tea in China, and all the copper in Washington, D.C., <laughs> it wouldn't profit you anything. If you could get everything this world has and have it and hug it to your bosom and lose your own soul, you'd have a bad deal. Now, I'm going to open the ledger book this morning. I'll tell you what I'm talk about. I'm not going to talk to you about what you have to give up to receive Jesus Christ. I'm going to go down the other side of the ledger, and I'm going to show you what you're going to give up if you don't accept him. And when I say count of the cost, I mean I'm going to put down the ledger this morning what it's going to cost you to go out of this door this morning as an unsaved man and woman. Now, I know how Southerners look at it. They say, well, preacher, I can't live it. I just can't live it. You know what they're thinking? They're thinking, if I get saved, I'm going to have to give up this and this and this and this. And when the average unsaved man counts the cost, you know what he's counting? He's counting what it's going to cost him if he gets saved. And I'm not going to talk about that this morning. I want to have you count the cost of what's going to cost you if you don't get saved. Number one, if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's going to cost you peace of mind and peace of conscience. And those are two of the most valuable things you have. You know why America is sick? America has seared its conscience with a hot iron. Do you know why a psychiatrist in America can get $35, $40 an hour sitting down talking with people? I wish I could get that much. You know, you know, you know why they get $35 and $40 an hour talking with people? Because people are so sick from a seared conscience and from sin, they'll pay that money to have somebody pat them on the back and tell them they're all right. Why, there, there isn't a psychiatrist in this country that doesn't have standing room only and enough clients to take care of seven days a week at 35 bucks an hour. The country is sick. You know why they're sick? They've lost a good conscience. A man who's had a good conscience sleeps in a storm. And America's conscience is sick. Everybody's sick. One woman said to another woman, she said, have you ever been to a psychiatrist? 
The other woman said, no. She said, what's the matter with you? Are you sick? <laughs> I mean, they get the idea, you know, if you haven't been, there's something wrong with you. Two ladies met each other one day going up to a psychiatrist's office, and one said, I'm feeling a little bit schizophrenic today. And the other one said, that makes four of us. <laughs> yeah, two and two. And you know, American people are sick because they've seared their conscience. Now, if you come to me and tell me about your problems and I say, well, it's just a mistake or an error, I'm putting a label on that bottle that doesn't change the content. The work of modern psychiatry is to make the disease look less than it is. You can't change a bottle of poison by putting bromo seltzer in the bottle. You've got to label the thing right. I can tell you how to, have a good, how to have a good conscience and go to sleep tonight. First thing you do is trust Jesus Christ, your Savior, and your conscience will quit killing you about it. Why, you got in Pensacola, you got 10,000 grown men who go to bed at night with their conscience just killing them because they know they ought to trust Christ and they haven't done it. They go out and get drunk. I would too if I were you. You say, Pete, preacher, you recommend liquor? If you're not going to get saved, it's just as good as anything else. Of course, you can blow your brains out. That's a quicker way. You can commit suicide low or fast, man. Blowing your brains out is cheaper. You get a 30 off 6 shell for 6 cents. Eight cents. Price has gone up. Eight cents since World War II. Eight cents. And it, that isn't as expensive as liquor. You say, what are you recommending? I'm saying before you have to drug yourself and deaden your conscience with all this stuff, why don't you do what your conscience is telling you to do, man? That Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. You don't call an error. You don't call a mistake. You wonder how to sleep good? Before you go to bed at night, go out there in the backyard or go into your bedroom someplace and shut the door and go through those things and call them what the Lord calls them. So that's a sin. I'm reaping what I sow. That's a sin. I ought to go to hell for that. But you've been mercy to me and merciful to me and you saved me and I'm born again and Lord forgive me and cleanse me. And go to bed with a uh, self-exorcism. Cast the devil out of yourself. Get down by your bed at night and say, Lord, get those demons out of me. Wash me in the blood. Get those devil's unclean spirits out of me. In the name of Jesus Christ, you unclean spirit, come out! <laughs> you ever do that? Well, it's cheaper than going to a nut doctor. <laughs> All right, number two. Number two. It'll cost you the most enduring joy in this life. Now, Christians have problems. And you've seen many a Christian in sorrow and distress and tribulation and persecuted and cast down, but not forsaken and not cast off. And I've been saved now 23, I'll be saved 23 years next March. I'm a pretty young Christian. I just reached maturity two years ago. I mean, as far as age goes, see. I mean, two years ago, I was only 21 years old. Now I'm 23, see. And so I've just got mature. But I'll tell you, dying truth, the most enduring joy I've ever had in this life, 27 years with the devil and 22 years with Jesus Christ, the most enduring joy I've had in this life has been him. It's been him. Now, I don't have you misunderstand me. I've had some other good things. I've enjoyed life. I don't guess any man enjoys just living any more than I do. If he has, I don't guess I ever met him. But I'll tell you, those things come and those things go. And the most enduring joy is Jesus. Always the same. Everything else is transitory. Nature is transitory. Your family is transitory. Your friends are transitory. Well, listen, I sat and ate the table with people that I thought would be my lifelong friends, then less than five years turn around the other way and try to shoot me off the board. And you have too. I'm not complaining. That's just life, brother. I'm not complaining. I just accept that and expect it. But Jesus is enduring. You know, if you're unsaved, the grass always looks green on the other side of the fence, don't it? And you just try one thing to another, and what you forget is if the grass is greener, the water bill is higher. Right? Right? Sure, man. Sure. You know, I've often thought, um, in, in nights like this, before uh, all my children came to live with me, I used to spend a lot of time with some of the young men in the school. I kind of adopted them for sons for a few years. And you know what we do? We go out there on that beach sometime before Fort Morgan or Alabama Point. In the summertime, we lie out there on the stars on that beach, you know, just like the hippies. I mean, no blankets or nothing, man. And we get a big fire going and fry some oysters or get some mullet and fry it fresh on that beach, man, and put some of that Tabasco sauce on it. They didn't, but I did. And then we lie down there on that beach at night, and you lie down there and look up those stars at night with that old soft breeze blowing. And boy, I'm telling you, I said to one of those boys one night, I said, you know what those hippies are looking for all the time? And they said, yes. I said, well, man, we found it. 
we got it. And you know, when you cook that food knowing the Lord gave you the food, and when you eat that food knowing the Lord gave you the ability to digest it, and then you lie down on the Lord's beach by the Lord's ocean and look up there and see what the Lord made, and you know he's yours and you're his, you can't beat it. And listen, if you're unsaved, you don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, you get out there and enjoy nature, but if the Lord isn't connected with it, it won't stick with you very long. You don't get the riches of it. You don't get the dregs of it. You don't get the essence, man. Unless you're just lying down there and knowing it's all the Lord. You just lie down and look up all those stars up there and look around, you know, and wait for a flying saucer to come by. <laughs> or an unidentified flying object, you know. And what if it did come over? Who'd care? I wouldn't care. If I'd lie there and so on go by, I'd say, well, there's another one. <laughs> You know, the most enduring joy in life is knowing Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you haven't got a joy that endures. I feel sorry for these hippies and the young kids trying to find it. I found it. I know where it is. Out there in Berkeley, California, you know, they don't say keep off the grass anymore. They say don't smoke the grass. They don't say, they don't have signs saying don't step on the flowers. They say don't step on the flower, people. Poor kid out there trying to make a living. Uh, folks talk about the generation gap. You see, he's over here, and the older generation is over here, and there's a gap between them. You know, you know the bridge of the gap? A rake, a hole, a shovel, a trowel, and a hammer. That'll bridge the gap. That'll reach all the way from me to him, brother, right over there. You can't tell me any bunch of folks lying around the grass smoking pot and smoking grass and going up to the uh, uh, president's office and putting their feet up on the table and spitting tobacco juice all over the uh, school halls. You can't tell me they're buying their own car insurance. I don't, I bet you're not even paying for their own gas. All right. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you'll lose the most abiding, enduring joy the world has to offer. Do you want to lose it? Count the cost. Number three. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you sacrifice the only real future hope that a man can have. Now here we are up in 1971. In the last couple of weeks, they voted Red China in the United Nations. Uh, when they voted them in, we should have voted out. Anybody knows that. Anybody knows we're not going to. Uh, when that thing took place, somebody looks to the United Nations and says, well, maybe they'll work things out. People, there have been, now listen to me, there have been more wars on this earth since the United Nations was founded than there was before it got there. There are five wars running right now, and there have been five since 1948. And any man that places hope in that outfit is really sick, brother. They ain't going to do anything. While we had a religious leader come over here a couple of years ago, and that poor deluded fella got up, and before television cameras and three continents, that fella got up there, and he said, the hope of the world is the United Nations. My, 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 my. The hope of the world is the United Nations. They're not my hope. They're not going to get, they're not going to bring the kingdom in. Now I know what the hope is. I have Jesus. And he's in me. And someday he's going to lift me up and get me out of the United Nations. I like a, I like a recruiting sign that, that was down in Canal Street in New Orleans. There was a recruiting sign for the Navy down there. And it showed four swabbies, you know. So I'm wearing their uniforms, no salute, and everything just slick and white and clean, you know. And one fella by it, he said, I want education, you know. The other fella, you know, was, I want to travel, you know. And one of them was, I want adventure. And then right across that, in almost illegible print, somebody taken a big black felt marker and written, I want out. <laughs> now, that's a real testimony, brother. That's from somebody who knows. What is your hope in? Let me ask you. Is your hope in your family? How do you know your family won't desert you? How do you know your family won't betray you? How do you know your family won't pile so many bills up over your head you won't be able to pay your way out? Is that what your hope is? Listen, when you reject Jesus Christ, you go out that door abandoning the only real hope any man or woman ever had. There is no real hope outside of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that when you sit down to dinner tonight or supper or whatever you call it, that's been 35,000 more people coming to this world than when you ate breakfast? And I didn't count the ones that died. 65,000 of them died. 
When you sat down this morning at breakfast, they begin to be born, and when you sit down at supper tonight at five or six, there are 35,000 more people in this world than was when you sat down. 65,000 of them died while they were born or as they were born or after they were born, but 35,000 of them got through. People, 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 people. You're, is that where you going to put your hope? But it's like an ant bed. They just crawl across each other like ants, man. If, why, if, if 35,000 of them died today, you wouldn't even know the names. You put your hope in that? In the man who's like grass, the son of man who's like the flower of the grass? Is your hope in the government? You're, you're not dumb enough to put your hope in the government, are you? Listen, if you want to see how the government takes care of folks, look at the American Indian. They sure took good care of him, didn't they? I like what a kid said one time. He said, my daddy's a civil servant. <laughs> he, met a, he met a civil service worker, you know, and he said, my daddy's a civil servant. <laughs> Recently, they just voted a corporation tax in, in Pensacola. Folks put a lot of faith in that, you know. You know what that means? It means all the corporations will raise the prices. You know that, don't you? You know what you just voted in? You just voted a tax in for yourself. That's all you did. Folks are funny, you know, putting the faith in the government. You say, well, I put this tax on these corporations so they won't tax us. You put a tax in the corporation, you just raise the price of it so you have to pay the extra tax. Anybody can figure that out. You just get inflation. I'm not going to put my faith in any outfit like that. A fellow wrote a book one time called How I Made a Million Dollars. And then the Eternal Revenue wrote a book right after that saying how we got 800,000 of it. (laughs) (laughs) It don't pay to be a millionaire anymore, brother. I don't put my hope in any of these things. I don't put my hope in television or science and all these modern inventions. I'm real reactionary. I like what a grandmother said to a grandchild one time. A grandchild said, Grandmama, what did you do when you were a little girl? So you didn't have any movies, you didn't have any television, you didn't have any cars. And she said, honey, we lived. We lived. A lot of truth in that. Is your hope in your job? Is your hope in your job? You might lose your job tomorrow. Some of you lost it already. <laughs> fellow went out to the Naval Air Station, got working out there, and they gave him his paycheck, and he looked, took one look at his paycheck, and he said, well, I see the government got another raise. <laughs> You know what men have told me in this church? They've told me when they got a raise, they made less money than before they got the raise. How many of you know that to be so? Let me see your hand. Look at that. There, there's 50 hands. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Boy, you'd be a fool to put your faith in that, wouldn't you? All right. The only sure hope for the future is the Lord Jesus Christ. Someday he's going to come. Someday he's going to get me out. And he's going to get me out. The government's not going to help me. My family's not going to help me. The United Nations is not going to help me. And I can't help myself. He's going to help me. And when you walk out of this door as an unsaved man or woman, you've thrown away the only real hope you can get. There is no other real hope. Go to the bank. Borrow the money. They're in debt up to their neck. Go to the government. Borrow the money. They're in $250 billion. How can you borrow money from a bankrupt corporation? All right, number four. If you go out of this building this morning without receiving Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you the highest manhood or womanhood that you got. Did you know no man is what he ought to be till he's saved? And did you know no woman is as good as she could be till she's saved? I've heard many women say, well, I think I'm pretty good, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm as good as most folks. You're not at your peak. You're not at your peak. You say, I'm as good as a lot of these Christians. You could be better if you got saved. I've heard Southerners say, well, I don't believe in arguing the Bible, you know. I don't believe in talking about politics and religion. Well, if you got saved, you'd have enough manhood to do it. I talked to the fellow one time. He said, the two things I never talk about, politics and religion, the fellow here in this town. And I told him, well, I said, I thought you were more mature than that. And he got real upset. and said, what do you mean by that? I said, a man that can't discuss politics and religion without getting mad is a baby. He didn't appreciate that either. You know something? I don't care how much courage you got or how much backbone you have as an unsaved man. You're never the man that you could be if you were to get saved. Now, I know Rommel and Napoleon and Charlemagne were great men. They weren't at their peak. They weren't at their peak. A man is always a better man for getting saved. A woman is always a better woman for being saved. You say, well, I know a lot of them do this and that and so forth and so on. You ever think of the mess you'd be in if you weren't saved? There isn't a man or woman in this building that wouldn't be a sorrier man or woman if you hadn't received Jesus Christ. And if you don't trust him, you lose your highest manhood or your highest womanhood. There's something degrading 
about not being right in the moral issue. There's something devitalizing about it, the quote of 20th century cl cliche. There's something that, there's something that's detrimental about a man sitting in a chair and knowing in his heart that he's wrong and ought to make it right and won't make it right. It sucks your manhood. It takes your courage. It makes you less than a man. I talked to a fellow one time challenging me for a fight and this and that. I just made fun of him. I called him Charlie Brown told him to go get a bottle and a suck on it. He was awful upset. And I told that fellow, I said, you know what you think? You think a man is a man to go around and get a brawl with somebody. I said, a man is a man that will take responsibilities, not pass the blame off on somebody else and be responsible for his condition and do what he can he ought to do and thank God that God gives him what he can give him and what he can't do he doesn't worry about it. He turns over the Lord. I said, well, that's Sandy, you're, you're not a man, you're a whistler's mother, man, you're a campfire girl. Oh, he got mad. Oh, he got mad. You know something, I don't care how brave you are, how much courage you got, you'd be a better man if you were to get saved. And you'd have more courage if you were to get saved. And you'd be a better woman. You ought to be less than a man than you ought to be? How about you men here? You want to be half a man? Well, then stay on the stage. I know it's irritating here, fellow talk that way. <laughs> I go up these camps in the summertime, I put her on them. I call them everything with white, man. And you know something? Some of those young men sit under there and they just stew under that thing and burn under that thing and smolder under that thing, boy. And you know what happens? They get right with God and get that Bible and go out and set the woods on fire. That's what happens. I want them to come around to me at the end of one of those camps last summer, a kid about 20 years old, bull neck, you know, about a 17 inch neck, shoulders coming out of his ears, you know, look like he'd been playing uh, you know, uh, linebacker for the Detroit Lions for about, is that a football team? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Green Bay Packers for 20 years. And that old boy came around there, you know, and he came up there and he said, uh, he said, you got me all upset. I said, good, good. And he said, you talk about this thing as though there was something real exciting about it. I said, there is. And he said, I wish I could do that. He said, I wish I could do that. He said, I just don't have the courage. I, I'd like to get in on that. So that stuff, it interests me. Yes, it does. And you know something? You can never be the man you ought to be by rejecting Jesus Christ. You counted the cost. So he takes out the ledger, he opens the ledger, and he says, Well, if I accept Christ, I'll have to give up this, and give up this, and give up this, and quit doing this, and quit doing this, and start doing this, and start doing this. Not today. Some other time, when I have a more convenient time, I'll call for thee. And over in the other side of the ledger, it says, If I don't trust Christ, I'll give up joy, I'll give up peace of mind, I'll give up a clear conscience, I'll give up happiness, I'll give up a sure hope for the future, I'll give up my manhood, I'll give up my womanhood. Have you counted the cost? You ought to count the cost before you turn down an invitation. All right. One time a teacher said to a little boy, looking at his drawing, he's making a drawing, she said, honey, that line isn't straight. And he said, well, I'll straighten it out later. And she said, honey, a line that's drawn straight doesn't have to be straightened out later. See? The thing to do is draw it straight to start with. You won't have to worry about getting it straight later. The thing to do is start with Christ, and then later you won't have so much to straighten out. All right, last. It costs God's favor and eternal life. When you walk out of these doors this morning the same way you came in, unconverted, unregenerate, alone in the world, without hope, without God, you go out these doors in God's disfavor. I don't hesitate to say it to you. John chapter 3 verse 36 says, He that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth. Present tense, abideth on him. Now, nearly everybody wants to belong. I've heard him say that's why young people get in so much trouble in high school. They get in high school, they get a gang spirit. Everybody wants to be accepted. Now, let me ask you this. Are you willing to go out that door this morning knowing that God does not accept you, that you're not in fellowship with him, that he does not approve of you, and there's no togetherness between you and your creator? Well, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. When I go out that door, he's my father, I'm his son, I'm in fellowship with him, and I have his approval. And you can never get it if you trust him as your savior. Young people, they, they say they get in trouble because they hang out in gangs, you know. They want to belong. Everybody wants to belong. I know some Christians that just want everybody to accept them. They didn't want to have anybody for an enemy. And they tried so hard, and they still have enemies. 
But they got a lot of people to be their friends. Well, do you want to walk out that door this morning knowing God is not your friend? It'll cost you God's favor. It'll cost you eternal life. It'll incur the wrath of God. The wrath of God. You go out that door this morning, you say, well, Brother Ruffman, if I were to get saved, then they expect me to do this and that and this and that. Now where I work, they call me preacher. They make fun of me. My relatives will probably get mad at me. Fellow said to me one time, if I were to get saved, he said my home would break up. Fellow said to me one time, if I were to get saved, he said my relatives give me a fit. I heard a fellow say one time, he said, if I were to get saved, I'd lose my job. I heard a fellow say to me one time over here near uh, Woodham uh, School, uh, he uh, drove a beer truck. He said, Preacher, if I had to get saved, I'd have to make a different kind of a living. I've got three children, and I've got to make a living. See, driving this here beer truck. And so when you ask a man to receive Jesus Christ, he counts up that cost, and he says, If I get saved, I'll have to do this, and this, and this. Let me tell you something, fella. If you don't trust Christ your Savior, you're going to have to give up eternal life. You're going to have to get, give up God's favor, and you're going to have to feel the cup of wrath poured out with fury upon those that aren't his children. I don't hesitate to say that. I know that's a dangerous thing to say these days, but you might as well say it. It's in the book. It's in the book. Oh, to live forever. Do you want to give up eternal life? I look at a congregation of people here this morning, and some of you need vitamin pills. <laughs> Your faces are white. You're not getting enough liver. <laughs> I look at some of you this morning, and you're nervous and upset, and you're flunking your grades at school. I look at some of you here this morning, you've got a social problem and family problem and education problems I can't solve. I don't even profess to be able to. I ain't that bright. I don't have trouble solving my own. I look at people here this morning, some of you don't have enough money to pay your bills. I look at people here this morning, you've got, all, you've got every kind of problem in the world. You want this, you want that, you want the other thing. Like old Moses said one time back in the book of Numbers, he said, oh, these people be almost ready to stone me. I can't carry all these people like a nursing father carries a sucking child. He said, it's enough, man. It's breaking my back. I can't stand it. All these needs and wants. And yet you know something? I've got an ace in the hole. I know one thing, that every man, woman, and child in this building wants and needs. You want to live forever. You say, not me. Yes, you. That's why you stay alive. Why don't you go off and die if you don't want to live forever? <laughs> you know, a fellow says, I want money. You want it till you get it. Then you want something else. You say, I want love. You want to get it, and then you want something else. Past is always greener. You want popularity till you get it. Then you want something else. I can't imagine anything any worse than being a notable movie star or television star. I cannot imagine anything any worse. I really can't. No privacy at all. Somebody poking a camera in your breakfast nook in the morning to take a picture of what kind of cereal you eat so they can advertise it on the television set. You want all these things, but good people, more than anything, you want to live forever. Now, are you going to live forever? Are you going to live forever in fellowship with your Creator? I am. That's my profession. Someday I'm going to leave here. When I leave here, I'm going to live forever and ever and ever and ever in fellowship with my Creator. Why? I did what he told him, what he told me to do. He said, Ruckman, you're a sinner. I said, Amen. He said, you're going to hell. I said, Amen. He said, you can't save yourself. I said, of course, I didn't say it, you know, so many Ways like that. Well, all I'm saying is people have kind of an assent to it, you know. And uh, you're going to hell, amen. And you can save yourself, amen. And my son can save you, amen. And will you trust him? Yes, Lord, I will trust him. And I'm going. Have you counted the cost? Back during World War II, October the 20th, D-Day, 1944, a Japanese ship sank a cruiser called the Honolulu out in the Philippine Sea. And that Japanese ship put a torpedo into that uh, cruiser and it sank. And down there on the third deck was a radio, radio man third class, whatever that is. I don't know the Navy well, I don't know what that is. A radio man third class. And his name was Lee. And Lee was down there three decks below deck. And that torpedo, when it hit, it opened up a 25-foot hole in the side of that cruiser. And that water came in and that boy banged out of his bunk screaming and all the lights in the place off. And he heard water, and the floor was wet, and he got a flashlight on and found a hole there in the, in the bulkhead about the size of a pillar. And the hatches were dog, but the hole was there. And he took the mattress and stuffed it in that hole and stopped it. And then he noticed about 15 little holes about the size of pencils in that room and water coming in them. 
Then he remembered the battle phones on the intercom, and he went over there and got that intercom on and got on there, and everybody was on it at the same time, and everybody was screaming and yelling, and nobody could hear him. And he began to cry and scream over that thing, and finally it got quiet enough where somebody could talk to him. And the captain of the ship, a man named Thurber, said, well, how's it going, Lee, boy? And he said, I, I can't get out, I'm drowning. And the captain said, we'll do the best we can to get you out. But he said, I've given the order to abandon the ship. And he fainted. And when he fainted, he fell down about a foot of water and revived him, and he got up again, got that intercom, and they got one of his friends there, a fellow named Bill something, other, I don't remember his last name. And Bill got on there and said, they're doing all they can to get you out, Lee, but we have to abandon the ship. I sure am sorry. He said, you got any morphine down there? And there was some morphine in a first aid kit, one of those compartments. And he said, yes. And Bill said, they've called by a destroyer to put a shot into the ship and finish it. And he said, if I were you, I'd take some morphine and go to sleep. He said, I'll let you know. I'll be the last one to leave the ship with the captain. He said, I'll let you know what we're going to do and maybe rather go that way. And he said, I'll try to have them get, make a direct hit when they hit. And he fainted again. Hit that floor again, came to again, got up in that intercom. When he got up there, there was a chaplain on there. And the chaplain began to tell him some jokes. And he stood there, he said his brain began to swim again, you know, and he couldn't keep his uh, senses about him. He didn't hear anything the man said. And after about 15 minutes, it began to come to him, and the chaplain was reading Psalm 23. And he realized he was reading his funeral. And then he hung up that intercom, waited around that water with that flashlight, praying and praying and praying, and the water getting higher and higher, almost up to his knees. And after about an hour of that thing, he heard the intercom again, and he picked the thing up, and the fellow said, we've called a couple of tugs alongside. They're going to try to get you out. And he began to scream, well, hurry, 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 hurry. And that water gets higher and higher above his knees now. And he prayed and prayed and wept and wept. He said he began to think about his mom and daddy back home washing dishes and getting food ready. Knew he was getting delirious. And after about two hours, he heard clinking and banging around there and the water up almost to his waist. And he got in the intercom and said, for God's sake, hurry. For God's sake, hurry. I'm going to drown. And they said, we tried to put a coffer dam over the overhead and we couldn't get it over. But they said, there's a fire room right next to your bulkhead. We'll try to cut through the bulkhead from the fire room number four and get through in there and to you. Another two hours went by. And he walked around there and that water got up to his waist. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and wept and wept and wept. And pretty soon somebody over the intercom got, got him and he picked up that time. He said, you can't do it. You can't do it. I'm going to drown. They said, now just take it easy. Take it easy. We're doing all we can. And uh, he, they said, put your hand on the wall. And he went over and put his hand in that bulkhead there and it began to turn kind of warm. Somebody had an acetylene torch on the other side of that thing. And then it turned pink. And then it turned red. And he began to scream and thank God and run up and down that water now, clear up near his chest. And a shower of sparks came through there and lit the place on fire. There was oil that floated on top of the water. The oil caught on fire. And he went under that water and then beat off the water above and tried to get breath and took the rest of the clothes off the bed and smothered that thing. And when the water was about to his shoulders, they broke a hole through there about that big around. And he dove for that thing, tried to get through, and got cut getting through. Wasn't big enough for him. He didn't care. And he's yelling, pull, 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 you know. And they yanked him through there and got him through there, all tore up and bloody. And they got him out, and he came out on deck, went to sick bay, and got bandaged up. And Lee said after he got feeling a little bit better, he got out walking around the deck of that ship, which was about four feet above the water. And he said he walked around there and saw a whole bunch of men lying there on the deck, all wrapped up in bandages like mummies, and blood soaking through their bandages. And he, he met his friend Bill there in the deck, and Bill came up to him and said, Why, Lee, he said, you're crying. You're crying. And, and Lee said, Yeah, he said, these men look like they're dying. And Bill said, They are dying. They are dying. Put them over the side in a while. And Lee said he walked around the deck of that ship and looked out there across the shore and saw the destroyers and the tugboats and the supply ships. And he said as he walked up and down that deck, he kept thinking, I wonder why the whole Navy would take 20 hours out just to get me out of a place like I was in. And I'll tell you, brother, I may spend an eternity in glory walking around and wondering why God went to the trouble he went to to save an old God-forsaken rascal like me, but he saved me. And someday I'm going to wash the sleep out of my eyes from the fountain of life and wash the tears out of my eyes from the backhand of a palm that was pierced and wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities, and I'm never know, going to know what it's like to have to drown under the wrath of God in a lake of fire. And if I were you, I'd count the cost. Let's pray.
Father, we pray this morning for souls, men and women, boys and girls, bound for eternity, lost, unprepared to meet God. Help them to count the cost this morning of losing enduring joy and peace and happiness and the clear conscience they need so badly and eternal life and the only real hope this world has to offer. Lay this message in the heart. May somebody here this morning walk these aisles and confess Jesus Christ as Savior and pass from death to life through the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Amen.